His name is Dr. Paul Laviolette, and he is the author of a number of books, uh, some of which we've talked about with him before on the air. Uh, the books include Beyond the Big Bang, Earth Under Fire, which of course uh, is available in video as well, Earth Under Fire. Anyway, Dr. Laviolette has a, a degree in physics from Johns Hopkins, uh, received a PhD in systems theory from Portland State. He uh, is a man uh, whose views are highly sought after in certain circles, and we are very fortunate to have him with us tonight. And so without further ado, uh, so Dr. Paul, thanks for... All right, so the last time that you were on the air, we, we talked quite a bit actually about um, the the primary focus of your research, and I'll let you sort of lay it out, but it has to do with uh, with galactic core explosions, uh, these uh, violent expl uh, explosions that occur at the center of galaxies, and uh, your research led you to the ice samples in Antarctica. Maybe, maybe we could start there, and we could talk a little bit about the theory and about what you find, uh, what you found in those ice uh, in those ice core samples. Okay. Yes, I was testing the theory. This was something I was doing for my PhD work in the uh, early 80s. Had gotten some ice from uh, Greenland and uh, Antarctica, uh, and uh, particularly in Greenland, I found uh, high levels of cosmic dust in the ice age part of the core, which was uh, confirming my hypothesis which was that uh, there had been a, a volley of cosmic rays coming from the galactic center around that time and had pushed in cosmic dust into the solar system, caused climatic, a climatic mess, so to speak, in the solar system. It filled the area with dust, included the sun, so that the radiation reaching the Earth was coming with a different spectrum. Hmm. much more reddened. You were getting light scattering. You, you wouldn't have seen the stars. You've gotten a lot more radiation actually coming to the Earth, but it wouldn't have been visible. It would have been uh, much of it infrared. It would have created a what I call the interplanetary hothouse effect. Then on top of that, it would have activated the sun and caused solar flaring almost continually, ice formation of the ice sheets, also ice melting. So there was all various aspects of this. But one of the key tests was to see if there was elevated levels of cosmic dust in the polar ice cap. How, um, time. how do you tell if there's cosmic dust? Is there a particular element or something that you're looking for? Yeah, uh, you look, for example, for iridium mm -hmm. or nickel, and these are very, at very high levels in cosmic dust, but on Earth much lower and uh, particularly iridium is a precious metal, about 10,000 times more abundant in cosmic material. Hmm. Gold was another one, and I did find gold at a fairly high level. As far as I know, I was the first to detect gold in polar ice. Interesting. What about beryllium? Wasn't that one you were looking for, too? No. To do that, you need a different uh, technique of analysis. Uh, you find that with mass spectrometers. I was using neutron activation which was where you bombard your sample in a reactor, make it radioactive, and then you measure gamma rays. Hmm. From that, you're That's able right. to tell what's in it. Whereas uh, beryllium-10, it's a radioactive isotope of beryllium that's created in the atmosphere when the atmosphere is bombarded with cosmic rays. And to se separate that particular isotope from the other beryllium isotopes, you need a, uh, an accelerator. Hmm. So it's a totally different approach. But other people had done that work. Okay. Uh, so that's was predicting high levels of that, and they, but the other groups had found high levels. So in the ice samples, you, you found these elevated levels of... Well, yeah, iridium, nickel. In fact, they were in the ratios that you would... Ex well, that they see in uh, cosmic material, oh. like comet or meteorite material, which tends to be very convincing that it was actually extraterrestrial and not contamination. It's difficult to make a case for contamination because where would the, all this iridium come from? Right, the, not from the laboratory. <laughs> right. In other, in other words, there's not, there's not an obvious terrestrial so, source for this stuff. Right. If anything, the, labor, if the laboratory dust had contaminated the samples, it would have diluted rather than hmm. created, you know, all this iridium. Right, right, right. Okay. The, uh, we also found uh, large amounts of tin in 
one sample, hmm. uh, which were, was known to be there before, because Solani Thompson, glaciologist at Ohio State, had found it and was puzzled by what was this pin. It was up to like 70%, 60 or 70% of it, of the sample was tin at one lo- uh, depth. Huh. And I worked with some people in uh, Australia who uh, were just beginning to measure uh, isotopes of tin. And uh, one of the things is if you find an isotopic anomaly in an element, this is another indication that, that it could be extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Because uh, if these tin particles were out in space, they'd get bombarded with uh, cosmic rays and it would change their isotopic ratios compared to what we have on Earth. And, in fact, they did find uh, a significant isotopic anomaly in this uh, tin, hmm. which was the first time uh, such a thing had been found. Interesting. And they, would say, and, they, and they were puzzled trying to come up with an answer for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this tin, though, came from a different depth than the area I was testing. I was planning to test uh, the period between 16,000 and 12,000 years ago, which was the end of the Ice Age. And right. it was also a time there where we had the worst mass extinction of animals since the time of the dinosaurs, the dying off of the mastodons and mammoths, saber-toothed tigers. So this was the period I was interested in, Mm, but my ice core work ended up testing an earlier period, so I was looking actually at an earlier super wave. All right, well, that was the next question then, was uh, once you take the ice core, what are the date, uh, the the, the time frames that, that, that you're looking at? So we're talking about... What, what did you say, 16,000 years uh, before the present date? So what's that, 14,000 B.C., something like that? Right. It, it, the, uh, the way I had gotten, there was a clue f- as to where to look. At the time I was doing this, uh, I was studying ancient myths and lores, uh, and I discovered there was a very advanced science coded in in these lores. Right, right, which we've talked about, yeah. And we're talking about a space-age science. Whoever had encoded this stuff was at least as advanced as we are or or more advanced. And at the same time, I was studying astronomy because I was working on a new physics theory. I was studying things like pulsars and pulsating stars, and, uh, stellar evolution, cosmology, things like this. Right. And... Uh, Having these two tracks of investigation going, uh, one day I was I noticed that, that there was this myth. Sagittarius uh, is shooting at the Scorpion. That these were part of this message that I was deciphering. And so when I laid out this arrow trajectory, as the myth talked about, it uh, came within a few degrees of the galactic center. And then I realized that this was actually pointing because there was a uh, an arrow there the arrow of Sagittarius. Right, right, the archer. Was uh, actually, it was purposely put there to point out the galactic center. All those stars have moved since the time. This was thousands of years back when these constellations were formed. And right, right, right. And, and maybe you could address it actually for, for a second. And Yeah, you, this is something that puzzled me a bit, you know, because there's various zodiacs. These are in particular zodiacal constellations. Mm-hmm, right. We have zodiac that we're familiar with that's in Western astrology. Uh, but then the Mesopotamians actually had, I believe, something like 18 uh, constellations along the zodiac. And then the Chinese, of course, have theirs, their constellations. But the ones that were part of this message that were designed actually as a cryptographic message, they employed certain cryptographic techniques, was the zodiac that's been handed down to, to us presently that involves normal signs of Taurus, Aries, Pisces, and so on. So why it is that the others didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that all constellations out there are part of a, a message. It just happened that this set right. I had discovered was. And also it included some constellations off of the ecliptic, uh, which would be include like uh, Sagitta, Aquila, mm-hmm. uh, Aquila is the eagle and is holding the arrow, Sajita, in its claw, and actually a oh, symbol on the, the dollar bill right, uh, right. sort of uh, connotes that. And then there's another constellation at the other side of the uh, southern hemisphere called Centaurus and Crucis, which uh, is the cross, southern mm-hmm. cross. Actually, southern they used cross. to be one constellation at one time. And these uh, 